Okay, let's talk about NMR spectroscopy or nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. It's incredibly complicated and probably one of the things that you get the hardest questions on in A-level chemistry. So let's try and break it down to its bare bones. If we want to put it in simple terms, it's using the absorption of different frequency radio waves to identify parts of a molecule. Now it is somewhat similar to infrared spectroscopy because that's to do with absorbing electromagnetic radiation as well, isn't it? But whereas infrared is absorbed by the electrons in the bonds, for NMR, it's all about the protons and neutrons or the nucleons in the atoms. You see, protons and neutrons have spin too. Now they're all spinning in different directions, but what we can do is make their spins line up. But they can do that two ways. The spin can either line up along the magnetic field or against the magnetic field. Now, if the number of nucleons is even, these are balanced. There's as many nucleons lined up along the field as there are against it. However, if the number of nucleons is odd, radio waves can be absorbed to flip the spin of a nucleon. Now it is a little bit more complicated than that to do with energy levels, but let's just leave it as that for now. You have to have an odd number of nucleons in order for these radio waves to be absorbed. And so what we find is that nucleons and therefore nuclei in different environments, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute, they absorb different frequencies. So what do we mean by a different environment? Well, let's draw ethane. Let's look at each carbon. Each carbon is bonded to three hydrogens and the other carbon. So therefore, they have the same environment. They're going to absorb the same frequency of radio waves in order to flip the spin of one of their nucleons. Hang on a minute, though. You might be thinking, isn't carbon usually carbon-12? Yes, it is. Carbon-12 has an even number of nucleons. Therefore, it doesn't work for carbon-12. But we know that a very small proportion of carbon is carbon-13. That's what we can use to do carbon dating. So for every few hundred ethane molecules, you'll get a couple of carbon-13 atoms in there somewhere, which means that we can use NMR for any organic compound. But we can use NMR not just on carbon atoms, but also hydrogen atoms or hydrogen nuclei, which of course we know is just one proton, isn't it? Hydrogen is just one one, it's just one proton. That is an odd number of nucleons, therefore it should work. And the same thing goes. Look at ethane. We can see that all six of these hydrogens are in the same environment. They're all bonded to a carbon. But the clever thing about NMR is that it doesn't just tell you what something is bonded to, tell you what the carbon that the hydrogen is bonded to is bonded to. More on that in a bit. Let's look at chloroethane. We have two carbons, but they're not in the same environment because one is bonded to three hydrogens, but the other one is bonded to two hydrogens and a chlorine. So they're going to absorb different frequencies of radio waves. And the same thing also goes for the hydrogens. These three hydrogens are in the same environment. However, these hydrogens are in a different environment. So we should end up with different frequencies absorbed by the hydrogens that I've circled in blue compared to the hydrogens I've circled in purple. Now, in true chemistry fashion, it's not enough for us to measure these different frequencies in hertz. We have to do it differently. So what we do is measure the frequencies relative to a standard substance, and that is tetramethylsilane. What we do is add to substance. So why this substance? Well, it's because it's unreactive and volatile. So we can remove it easily. But the most important thing is that it only absorbs one frequency. Why is that? That's because this molecule is completely symmetrical, whichever way you cut it. In other words, all the carbons and all the hydrogens have the same environment. So we should only see one frequency absorbed. Okay, let's go for carbon 13 NMR first because it's quite a bit easier than hydrogen. So what would the results from NMR look like? Well, we'd have our x-axis here, and that's essentially frequency. But like we said, we can't just do frequency. We can't just be as simple as that, can we? We change it to something called chemical shift, and this is done relative to tetramethylsilane, like we saw earlier. We're always going to see this peak, and that is from the radio waves being absorbed by this compound. And then to the left, we're going to see 
other peaks from our actual substance that we're looking at. Incidentally, we can give this symbol a lowercase delta and the units are parts per million. We can call this compound TMS for short. Now I haven't really drawn these peaks in the right place, but just to give you an idea, let's say that we have a peak at 25 and one at 70. So then we need to figure out what these peaks are actually referring to. Let's say that we know that the chemical formula for this compound is C2H5OH. Now I'm just giving you a really easy example. This of course is ethanol, isn't it? So now we need to actually figure out what these peaks mean. And for that, you're going to need a table and you're never going to have to remember these. You'll always be given one. Now you can see the table that you might be supplied with on the left hand side, at least half of it. And we can see the type of carbon that we have has a range of frequencies or a range of chemical shifts that it could fall within. But we can see that we have 25. And so that looks like we're going to have one of these, doesn't it? And then we also have 70 as well. Well, that looks like it's going to be a carbon bonded to an oxygen, a single bond that is. Of course, if we draw ethanol, we know this is the case. We have a carbon bonded to a carbon, and then we have carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen as well. The hydroxyl group. There we go. Knowing what the formula is, we've identified exactly what the structure of this molecule is. Now, of course, it gets difficult when you end up with more complex molecules. NMR can be used to determine what environments exist for the carbons inside of the molecule. And hopefully with that as well, we can distinguish between isomers too. So let's have a look at an example of a question. Very simple one. Let's say that we know the molecular formula of this unknown compound is C4H6O. So can we pick out the structures inside the molecule? We're looking at our table. We have 25. Well, it could be a couple of things, couldn't it? It could be just our carbon-carbon environment. It's not going to be this one because we don't have chlorine or bromine in there, but it could be this too. And here we have 128 and 138, very close to each other. So it's likely they're going to be due to the carbons double bonded to each other. But the fact that we have two of them means that our carbons are going to be in slightly different environments. And here we have 198. Well, that definitely looks like it's going to be our carbon oxygen. Now look at this. We know that we have this, so actually that could inform us about which one of these is correct, it's probably going to be this one. We're going to have carbon bonded to that carbon and oxygen. So let's start building it up. We know this is going to be in here. We know it's going to be single bonded to, well, we've already taken care of our oxygen, haven't we? So all we've got left is our few carbons and hydrogens. So we know that it has to be a single bonded carbon to that. And we know also that we have a carbon down here. If this is the case, then of course, this is just going to be methyl group. But then we have one more carbon and we know that we have to have a double bond. So actually it looks like we're going to end up with this structure here. And so this would be but 3 e 2 own So there we go. That's a fairly simple carbon 13 NMR spectrum. But they get a lot, lot harder. Just remember that like we said, we have this range of chemical shift for carbons in these environments because what they're bonded to is going to affect their chemical shift. Now, one thing you need to be aware of is that the distance from functional groups in a molecule will affect the chemical shift of carbon and hydrogen atoms. So let's draw three isomers, three cyclic alcohols to demonstrate this. Here we have cyclohexan 1,2-diol, 1,3-diol and 1,4-diol. Question is, how many peaks are we going to see for each on the NMR spectra. Let's have a look for the different environments in our first isomer, cyclohexane 1,2-diol. We can see that these carbons are in identical environments. These two here, they're in identical environments as well because they're both bonded to the same things and they're the same, and they're the same distance away from the hydroxyl group. And then we have these two here, the fourth and fifth carbons. They're in identical environments as well even though both the blue carbons and the green carbons here are both bonded to two carbons each, the blue carbons are further away from the hydroxyl groups. So therefore, the blue carbons are in a different environment to the green carbons. So we should see three peaks on our spectrum. And you'll notice that there's a bit of a shortcut, hopefully, because we can see that this molecule is symmetrical about this line. So we can just count how many environments there are on one side and then double it up. We have three pairs of identical environments. What about the second isomer here? Let's draw line of symmetry. It's going to be through the carbons this time. So therefore we can say that this carbon is in its own unique environment. 
these carbons are in the same environment. These ones are the same distance away from the hydroxyl groups as well. And then we have this one here on its own as well. Even though it's on the line, as well as the blue carbon, of course it's not in the same environment, is it? So this time we should see four peaks on our spectrum. Finally, we have our third isomer. There's not only just one line of symmetry this time, there's actually two. We can see that these carbons are in the same environment. This one and this one are symmetrical. They're in the same environment, but also they're symmetrical to these two. So the four red carbons here are in identical environments. So therefore we should only see two peaks on our spectrum. I haven't thought about the heights of the peaks. I'm just drawing how many there are. So that's something worth thinking about. Lines of symmetry in molecules. It doesn't just go for molecules that have aromatic rings. It can go for any molecules that are symmetrical. Then we can go on to hydrogen or proton NMR. And the reason this is more complex is because it not only tells you what environments hydrogens are in, but it can also give the proportions of these protons in different environments. So let's bring back ethanol again. Now we're going to have a graph again with chemical shift on the bottom, and we're going to have our TMS peak again. Now what we find is this peak at one is three times as tall as the peak at two parts per million. And so now we need to bring in our table for proton NMR. So look at this, we have a type of proton at the top attached to an oxygen. So a chemical shift of two does sit within that range, doesn't it? Just below that, we can see that we have CH3 and one sits inside that range too. So we can see that we probably have an OH and a CH3, but we can see that our peak for the bottom one is three times as big as the top one. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because look, because it's CH3, we have three times as many protons in this environment as we do in the hydroxyl group. Now, as you can see from the display formula in the table, the chemical shift doesn't just depend on what the hydrogen is bonded to, it also depends on what that is bonded to itself. Atoms further away from the hydrogen have a knock-on effect on what frequencies are going to be absorbed by the hydrogen. And actually, if we take this into account, that can explain some weirdness that we can see in our results as well. See, if you do high resolution NMR spectroscopy, then you actually find that you can end up with split peaks or multiple peaks in one. Now, why do we have these peaks? Well, it's because they're affected by the hydrogens on neighboring carbons. So like we said, atoms not bonded directly to the hydrogen can affect a hydrogen. And the number of split peaks is equal to the number of hydrogens on neighboring carbon plus one. So for an example, let's look at 112 tribromoethane. So let's have a look at this hydrogen here, and we find a peak here on the spectrum. But look at this, how many hydrogens are on the neighboring carbon? There are two. So we should have three peaks as a result. Two hydrogens on the neighboring carbon, so we have three peaks. Conversely, if we have a look at these hydrogens here, they're in the same environment, and let's say the peak should be here, but we can see that there's one hydrogen on the neighboring carbon, so therefore that's why we have two peaks. The issue is now that we have these peaks being split, so the height is going to be a little bit messed up. And so instead of just the height, we actually take the area under the peaks, and that gives relative absorption. What should the area be for these? Well, we can see that we have two hydrogens, on the right and one hydrogen on the left, so therefore we should have an area of two for this one and an area of one for this one. But you'll, but you'll usually be given the area, and usually that is given by a number on top of the peak. Of course, I am missing my little TMS peak here, aren't I? So we can bring together all of these ideas to determine what's in a molecule. We can use carbon-13. NMR. That gives you what is bonded to carbons. And then we can use the proton NMR. This gives you a number of things, doesn't it? What the hydrogens are bonded to, how many hydrogens in the same environment, and also how many hydrogens on neighboring carbons. We get that with the split peaks. So let's say that we have this proton NMR spectrum here, and the areas under these peaks 
are these. And incidentally, it hasn't split, it's just a singlet, then a doublet, triplet, and a quartet. The molecular formula is going to be this time C4H8O2. So what's the structure going to be? Well, let's start off with this one here. We can see that we have a quartet, so four peaks. And what did we say about the N plus one rule? That means that there are three hydrogens on a neighboring carbon. So that means that there has to be a methyl group, CH3. And that's going to be fairly standard. You're going to see a quartet on a lot of NMR spectra. But where are these hydrogens then? Well, we want this CH3, and that's going to be from 0 0.7 to 1.2. And so therefore, that's going to be this peak here, this triplet. And we can see the area is three, but we can also see that it's a triplet, three peaks. That means there are two hydrogens on the neighboring carbon. That must mean that we have CH2. And that seems to fit in with this type of proton in our table. But then we have this peak in the middle. Now it's a singlet, which means that, well, if it's only one peak, there are no H's on the neighboring carbon. But we do have, but we do have three hydrogens in this environment. So again, it's probably going to be a methyl group. So this looks like it's probably going to be an ester. So this looks like it's probably going to be an ester. So I guess there are really two options. So what are our two options? Well, we could have, well, I guess we could have two options. We know we have to have two methyl groups, so one on each end. So, but which one is it going to be? Well, the clue is to do with this one here. We have one peak that's got an area of three, which means that there have to be three hydrogens next to a carbon with no hydrogens on. And so this cannot be correct. It has to be this here. So let's have a look, does this check out? And yes, we know we have to have CH2 and CH3. These two peaks will give you an ethyl group. And so that's gonna be fairly common as well. So this ends up being ethyl ethanoate. Of course, there's another clue as well, isn't there? Remember over here, we said that we only have an area of two for these, so it has to be CH2 bonded to the oxygen. So therefore, that is not possible. So it's all just a big puzzle. You've got loads of different things that all feed into each other. And it's all about just unlocking those little bits, bit by bit, as you uncover the mystery of what your compound is. It's almost like a Sudoku. I've given you two very, very easy examples. It's up to you to have a go at some examples, some harder ones. It's one of those things that really needs a lot of exam practice. So you get better at recognizing the kind of patterns that we're looking for that crop up time and again. So I hope you found this helpful. If you did, please leave a like. And if you have any suggestions on what I could do next, then leave a comment below. See you next time.